All right, here we go, John B. Vlad, my man. Welcome Good to Vlad to TV. You, Good to see you, my friend. Well, me and you actually go back like 15 years. Yes, sir. Yep, I was at your studio. Absolutely, uh, came to the bottom of the leg, yep. And we were laying down some <laughs> vocals, which ended up being on the Tupac Rap Phenomenon mixtape. That's right, man, yeah. Which was really kind of what got me in the game. That's what's up. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't for that, I might be working a nine to five right now. You were smashing the mixtapes back then. I man. was. Yeah, you did. I was. It. Absolutely. And yeah. Then I had to grow up and get that. a real job. <laughs> 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 and here I am now. <laughs> hey, man, well, listen, you're That's looking right. great. Looking Bless healthy. You, man. Thank you, man. Thin. Appreciate you. Skin Thank looks you. nice. All right. <laughs> you know, for guys that are in our, our mid 40s, this you know is. You know? Trying to age gracefully. Yeah. That's what's up, man. Thank you. Yeah, man. I mean, listen, we've lost a lot of our legends. Yes, sir. At our yes, sir. age, yes, sir. or younger, yes, sir. So I think it's important to kind of really maintain your health. Without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. I think music has kept me young. You know, mm. the the love for what I do, the passion for what I do, and also having a, a beautiful family. You know, some someone to love, as my song says. You know, yeah. some some you know uh, something beautiful to you know kind of uh, always reflect back to. You know, on a daily basis, I think is. Kind of been a fountain of youth for me, man. I don't, I really, I don't stress out too much other than, you know, having to leave that, that, that security of having the, the home that I have, that I've been blessed to be able, you know, be able to have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's important. Family. When you look at almost yeah. every successful person, they have a strong foundation, a mm. strong group of people in their yeah. corner. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, that explains a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is your first time actually here on Vlad TV, so let's go ahead and start in the beginning. Yeah. So I guess you were born in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. but you grew up in L.A. Yes, I, I was born in Providence, uh, and uh, my dad got a job as a music professor at Cal State L.A. out here um, when I turned about four years old. So we moved to the West Coast and, uh, you know, grew up in Altadena, California, Pasadena, basically, you know, upper Pasadena. And, uh, yeah. Well, your whole family is actually musicians, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you mentioned your dad. Um, Mother's a concert pianist. My yeah. brother's a cellist. My uh, sister's a violinist. You know, and uh, yeah, so it's very much. You know, there's some ho households that have you know athletics. Athleticism is like the main thing. You know, everyone mm -hmm. played a sport in the family. Well, everyone played it. You know, an instrument. Everyone made it a career. You know, so it was sort of like hard to escape that sort of being the destiny, you know, my destiny. And really on a daily basis, just watching my sister play, you know, pra practice her instrument for like eight hours a day was something that inspired me. And I want to go in there and be good, good at an instrument too. So, you know, whether it was the keyboard or my drums, uh, you know, that was, those were my first two instruments was a drum set and, you know, playing a synthesizer. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess I you started singing it around, yeah. around eight years old? Yeah, yeah, that's right when I, I, you know, picked up the keyboard for the first time, it was around eight, and started to make songs, and um, of course singing, you know, uh, but really, you know, primarily making beats, beating on anything I could, tables or whatever, and, uh, you know, and playing the piano and singing, yeah, by okay. the way. So, I mean, you have these parents that are professional musicians. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, I know how badly I sing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I actually have, an, you know, as a DJ, you have an ear for music, right. and I know exactly how bad I am. So you started singing, and did your parents kind of like start to mold you a little bit, like, oh no, do this different and do this, breathe a little different here and whatever, mm. or was it kind of just natural for you? You know, what's interesting is my my parents are classically trained musicians. They're classical musicians by all means, so their world isn't the commercial music world. It's not the you know the jazz, the hip hop, the the R&B, the rock, whatever else um, that, that, that's in my world. So it was very much a self-taught kind of like, you know, what was, what was intuitive to me, you know, um, and really learning by ear, you know, showing myself. My mom tried to, she's actually a piano teacher, hmm. and at a young age she was my first, you know, learning how to play my first chords or whatnot. But she would try to put pieces in front of me where she thought I was reading the music, but I was really just memorizing what <laughs> the way the song went. And she said, "Are you? Are you playing? Well, play this part right here." And I, I don't, I don't know what that part is. <laughs> she caught me one day, and you know. But yeah, I just taught my, I, I taught myself how to play, you know. And uh, and from that point, it began to be something that was more of a, a visceral thing, like sit down at the piano and make my myself feel a certain type of way, you know, like, okay, I'm feeling 
like this right now. And that was a great escape as a young kid. I'm sure I pissed off a lot of my friends because I'd go over to their houses if they had a piano instead of playing outside and you know doing whatever else that you, most kids do. Um, I'd be stuck on the piano in the house, you know. And they'd, man, all he wants to do is play the piano when he comes over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, young okay. age, man, right away with the music. And were you taking to R and B early or or not really? Because I mean, you and I are right around the same age. Mm. Like, mm. you know, hip hop mm. was starting to form yeah. around that time. You didn't really have white R and B singers, really. Mm -mm, nah. You're talking and when, about and the, when you the, the did, 80s. It was yeah. sort of like it was very, very kind of. Kind of Cutting the line between pop and like you know hollow notes didn't really didn't really count you know what yeah because I mean? it was very much they kind yeah. of like even though Daryl Hall is real kind of a thing Daryl Hall was really soulful. soulful singer same with Michael McDonald yeah. and right you know but they were doing pop music yeah it was very much pop even with George Michael's it was very much pop true um, so there wasn't any sort of like R and B you know as they say blue eyed soul singers back then right. Um, so, but interesting enough, I was very, very much influenced by Michael Jackson early on. I was very inf influenced by groups like Duran Duran early, early on with this video age, the brand new, you know, idea of videos being on TV. Oh, wow. Like, you know, wow, what is that? It's a music video. And we were at the dawn of that, you know. Yeah. And it was a new sort of thing that was very exciting to watch a song come to life in visual, in a visual. Um, and that gave us so much imagination at a young age. That was really what pushed me along in terms of really made me say, uh, well, first of all, my, my favorite band was Duran Duran because my, my sister grew up, that was her favorite band. She's three years older than me. Mm -hmm. And of course she's listening to that. She's going, oh my God, this is the mo most amazing music you've ever heard. And I said, who is that? You know, check them out. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Of course, you know, and, um. And the same goes for Michael Jackson. So these bands kind of drew me in and I got into Earth, Wind and Fire. I got into the Bee Gees. I got into Rod Stewart. I got into Donna Summer. And I, I kind of picked up things from each of these, you know, these music, you know, these musicians. It was, uh, I think, melodic things, rhythmic things, ways that they sang. You know, when I, by the time I got to Luther Vandross and, and Marvin Gaye, I was already so filled up with you know, inspiration from these other, you know, bands that, uh, you know, I, my musical sort of influence was very, very, uh, uh, very wide for my age at, you know, by the time I started really making, recording music at like 10, 11 years old, I was very well versed in a great deal of styles, you know. Okay, so you're already recording it at 10 years old. Absolutely, making so, like making tapes. Four track, on, I guess. Yeah, I was recording on a little Tascam uh, mm -hmm. four track recorder and taking the tapes and selling them at school for five bucks. You know, <laughs> you're anyway. selling your own stuff. Yeah, it was uh, actually. People were buying it. It was all my friends, you know, that wanted to support me. Hey, like, can I get one of those tapes? You know, it's, I'll pay you next week. It's like, oh, yeah, I got it too, <laughs> man. Yeah. Okay, so you're recording at 10. And I guess you end up going to L.A. County High School for Performing Arts. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, my my um, my early my early on um, experiences with music, first initial real sort of like push off was a, a faith an act of faith, leap of faith was um, the eighth grade talent show at my middle school, which was judged by the group Troop from mm -hmm. Pasadena. Steve Russell is a good friend of mine still to this day, and he's the lead singer of the group Troop. And we were just talking about this the other day that he was the judge and the group, um, and they they allowed me to win at that talent show. So that was sort of like the first initial thing to let me know, like, wow, I could do this. You know, I could perform in front of the audience and watch my friends go crazy, and I could still hold it together. And I kind of had the gall to do that, you know. And uh, that was the first time ever doing that, so that was exciting. And then from that point on, I think the talent show thing began to be something that was a way for me to get my foot in the door and let people know, hey, I'm, I'm you know, writing my music, I'm producing, and I'm performing my music. So it, it was a little different for me to kind of set my keyboards up on stage and have like a couple synthesizers and a drum machine. Like they knew that I meant business when I, when I pulled up for the sound shake. <laughs> and all the other kids were like lip syncing, you know what I mean? It's like okay, we're really professional at this, you know, at, at, a, at a young age. And um, I just really took it seriously right away. So 
by the time, you know, senior year of high school came and all my, you know, teachers at the, you know, you know, academically, they were basically saying, hey, it doesn't look good for you, kid. You better, you know, you better do something good. <laughs> College is not in your future. Yeah, yeah. you know, and um, my dad was like, you know, yeah, you got to get a record deal, you know, because it's, what are you going to do, that kind of thing. And I was like, well, I, I plan to come back with a record deal. And so that year was really real for me. I would, I, I turned 18 my senior year of high school, and it was very, very cool because I was able to write myself out of class and go shop my CD down, you know, my tapes down. Um, back then it was cassettes, y'all. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had cassettes and CDs to, uh, to shop. But, you know, we were, um, I was waiting in the lobbies of a lot of these labels and just waiting for someone to get out for their lunch break so I could meet them in the hallway just casually and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Jonathan. I used to call myself Jonathan B. back then. I was trying to, you know, that seemed a little more professional to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then la later they shortened that. But uh, yeah, man, um, you know, I was able to get into the door of Babyface, you know, and Tracy Edmonds, and that was, you know, what sent this whole thing, you know, off. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess you, you went and dropped off your demo, yeah. what ended up being Yabium. Yes. Yeah. Yabium yeah. Records, mm -hmm. yeah. which was Babyface's wife's label? Yes, yes. Tracy Edmonds, um, Babyface's ex wife. Ex wife, yeah. yeah. Um, they, were basically they started um, Yab Yum Entertainment, which was the Ed Edmonds record group as well. Okay. And uh, it started off as Yab, Yab Yum Entertainment. And it was right on Third Street. It was a little hole in the wall record label. And I was dropping off all my music to everyone. So I dropped off my music there and then I left because I figured, you know, no one's there to sort of talk to me about my music. So um, we'll, you know, leave that one. We'll see what happens. I went over to Motown, I was in a meeting at Motown, and during the meeting, the guy picked up the phone and is, you know, he's like, on the, yeah, I have a John B here, and he's, okay. Uh, Babyface is on the phone, he said, you just dropped off. <laughs> he said, come back to the office, he wants to talk to you. Man, why are you in my office talking to me when you got baby? <laughs> you know, I remember leaving there feeling like, oh man, you know, I'm about to go talk to Babyface, you know, and, Really, the rest was history. When I walked through the door, it was kind of like evident, okay, we need to be working together. My demo sort of sounded like finished records at that point. He was very impressed with, uh, with what I was doing. And a matter of fact, I have a song that was um, one of my most successful songs. It was called uh, What You Say Boo, I Do. It was, called, uh, it was a platinum single. It was actually... I wrote that when I was 16, 17 years old, and that was on my first demo that I actually gave uh, Kenny and Tracy. And um, yeah, that was what got me signed. But we held that one off for a couple, you know, years, and we sort of that just kind of held on. And then when it came time to put the album out, uh, my second album out, we was like, why don't we use this one? So yeah, we brought that back. Okay, so at at the time when you first signed. Was Babyface still doing the face? No, actually, um, and you know, well, I'm sure he was doing the face creatively, being involved in those projects. But uh, yeah, the the whole thing with Yabium Entertainment was it was sort of like a branch off of you know Babyface himself making a new label with his wife, and I was uh -huh. the first artist to be signed to that label. So okay, yeah. Well, I mean, because the face was a monster. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, was. L.A. Reid and Babyface yeah. were still monsters yeah. to this day. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, LaFace was like outcast. Absolutely. Everyone, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Tony that, Braxton. Everyone uh, that was signed to LaFace is a stamp, you know, in, in R&B or hip hop. Absolutely, for sure. I mean. Donnell Jones, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. You have this giant of a label, mm -hmm. and then Babyface decides to go off and start his own thing. Mm-hmm. Now, was Tracy Emmons really a music person like that? Because she was well, you more know, like a model at the time. Yeah, no, no, Business absolutely. person, like... No, not, you know, you're talking about someone who had never done it before. Right. Um, and really just had the, the passion and the, the want to do that and had the opportunity because, right. you know... She was here, married to a baby face. Her, yeah, <laughs> had, had married to baby face. So, you know, all she had to do was want, want to do that. And in a sense, I really loved having... Um, that that team around me of people that were able to take my music 
and take a kid who was so scared to, to be an artist at the time and so didn't want to be out there in front of the people, but I wanted to be behind the scenes in the studio making the music, but I didn't necessarily know how to be an artist. And they took that kind of shy little kid and they kind of, you know, okay, you know, nah, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the one, you know, do it like this, you know, and just kind of like help really polish me up a bit. So by the time I, I had came out, you know, my second album, Cool Relax, it was very, very much of a focused kind of a thing where I was, you know, writing most of the records myself and producing most of the records myself. Well, I mean, here you are, how old, how old are you, 18, 19 at this point? When you, when you signed to, to yeah, Yabby? Yeah, when I signed, yeah, it was 19. 19. Yeah. And you're working with Babyface, who's considered one of the all-time greats in R&B, both in singing and songwriting and producing yeah. and so forth. What was it like to really work with someone of that caliber, fresh out of high school? Absolutely. Well, first of all, Babyface was my absolute favorite R&B guy. Um, from a songwriter's point of view, it was he was the guy that I sort of like got in touch with the emotion, the real emotion behind R&B. Like the best part about R&B that I love is how it could just grab the, your emotions. Whether it's, it doesn't matter. You know, everything under the <laughs> the sun of emotions, you know, it's like from you know, happy, sad to sexy to, you know, anything. So um, I think he was very, very good at articulating a lot of different emotions. And so as a young man, he was sort of like my father to the game. I really paid attention to, to his style and his way of doing, delivering the music, you know, the songs. And um, it was people like, L.A. Reid, Babyface, you know, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, very, very influential in my chord structures, the way that I learned how to play chords, my melodic ideas. Even lyrically, I felt like there was a lot that I sort of learned, like how, why R&B, the best R&B songs, why, why are they good? You know, it's because of this, you know, these ingredients. And so I really take my hat off to uh, Babyface for seeing something in me that, you know, he felt like he related to, uh, to be able to give me that shot at, at a young age and say, oh, you know, not only can you hold yourself as a producer in the studio and as a writer, but now nah, you got what it takes to be an artist. You step, step on out from behind the booth and, or from, you know, behind the, the keyboards. Cause I was actually, my first job was playing keyboards for Kenny back, back behind uh, in his band. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was nice enough to let me be a part of his band and, um, and then after that, you know, I, I got to work with New Edition. I got to work with uh, Tony Braxton. Got to work with Color Me Bad. Got to work with um, After Seven. And I want to say rest in peace. Yeah, to, rest in peace. My uh, man, Melvin. Just passed. Edmonds just passed yesterday. And uh, I was able to have the, I was blessed enough to be able to uh, have the pleasure to work with him and, and, and produce for him and write for him. And uh, it was on the album Reflections. And uh, we we have many songs that we, we've, we've recorded together in the studio and spend a lot of time. And one of the songs that was um, incredible, I want to reflect back to it since I mentioned Melvin's name, is, is a song called Damn Thing Called Love, which they did a video for, which was a single from, from the album that I wrote and produced. And it's, it's crazy. That was like a, the song that was on my original demo that I gave hmm. Babyface. And he heard that and he was like, yeah, okay, you... I could tell that I'm an influence, you know, he, he, I just, I said to him, I, I want to be one of the guys on the team, you know what I mean? I know that you work with Dallas Austin, I know mm -hmm. you work with, uh, you know, lots of different guys, so I want to be one of the guys, and, um, you know, he, he made that happen, so. Someone to Love on your first album featured yeah. Babyface. Yeah. Um, which actually got nominated for a Grammy. Yeah. How did that feel? Your first time out, yeah, nominated. I mean, it, I mean, you didn't win, unfortunately, but you got nominated the well, first mean, time out. It's incredible. The whole thing was I, I went into the studio one day with him at a, actually at his house. We were recording, um, and he had the song Someone to Love. He played me the track, he played me the song. I loved it. And so, but he, he didn't have any lead vocals recorded on it. He basically just had like a little scratch vocal that had the lyrics to let me know how it went. But he's like, okay, so let's record it. So I went and I, I recorded the first verse, right? And he's like, okay, I love it. Now I'm gonna do my part. So I said, okay, cool. So I can learn how to do 
the part, right? I'm thinking he's just laying the part so I can learn the melody. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna sing the second verse. I was like, <laughs> like a duet? He's like, yeah, now think about it. I'm, this is the guy who I used to imitate his vocals for people in high school, like try to really sound as much of like him as possible uh, to impress girls, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, and, and it, one of the most influential vocalists, just like Marvin Gaye or Michael Jackson, he's up there, you know, for me. Yeah. So to get him <laughs> at 19 or 20, whatever it was, to sing on my first record that I ever put out was very, very much, you couldn't tell me, I mean, you had to pinch me, you know what I mean? To let me know like, okay, dude, this is happening. And um, yeah, I was very, very much in awe of the whole thing, let alone we got a Grammy nom, you know, for that. And um, you know, the movie was in the Bad Boy soundtrack and all that. So right away it was sort of like, okay, we're off to the races. You know, so, so. Well, I mean, you guys sound kind of similar. I mean, on it, that was, song. it was evident, you know, on that song. Definitely yeah. want to show that from the jump. This is the guy who is sort of like the foundation for what I do, you know. Yeah. Um, in R&B, there's only so many pillars that are really holding up, you know, the foundation. It's like the foundation, you know. Uh, so I, I'm one of those guys who likes to go back and show, show my influence because I didn't start off wanting to be an artist. I started off wanting to be a producer and I use my vocals as a technique to, as a tool to kind of get my songs and my production to artists. So if I wrote a song for Luther Vandross, I sang the song, dun, 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 you know, in a, in a Luther vibe and I, I can do Luther vibe, you know, I could do a Babyface vibe, I could do a Ralph Tresvant or a Johnny Gill or, you know what I mean? Because I'm a big fan of R&B music. So it was interesting people caught that that glimpse of my influence with Babyface and they instantaneously thought that's the way his voice sounds on everything he sings, you know? And right, which it isn't. Which is not. Yeah. And so it, it took records like, um, you know, They Don't Know, which was very, very much, I think it still to this day is sort of like the song I think people best know me for and, and you know, really, they come to the show and they sing that the loudest, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that was a song I sort of like really spread my wings and, and, and got, got to uh, shine in my own right and stepped out, uh, out, out mm -hmm. of the shadow of Babyface. Well, I mean, you, know, you mentioned that you were writing, you know, for a few people. You said Tony Braxton, mm -hmm. um, Color Me Bad, mm -hmm. but also Michael Jackson. Well, I didn't write the song, but I had the, the, uh, the pleasure of working with his, uh, his voice in the studio um, and getting to, uh, we were managed by the same manager, uh, Sandy Gallen and Jim Mori. And, and Who also managed Michael Jackson? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it's pretty was, much as high as you can get. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, you know, in the office a lot and uh, it'd be like, okay, oh, we got to cut this meeting short. Mike is on his way in. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, because of that, it was, a cool opportunity for you know for me to work with uh, the song "You Are Not Alone" that R. Kelly wrote, but mm -hmm. I, I had the opportunity to be the only person uh, besides Jimmy T Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis to uh, to get to remix it. Hmm. Well, I think Frankie Knuckles did a house mix, but I was I did the official remix um, for it, and it was really cool because you know I remember him calling the you know the studio to check on me and just say, you know I like the mix and thanks a lot, man, for doing this. And I was just like. Incredible. Can't wait to shake your hand, meet you in person. And then, of course, I met him at the Brit Awards. Ah. Uh, Jim Moore brought me backstage and I, I met Mike and got to shake his hand. And, you know, uh, that was really cool. Yeah. Dope. Dope. So the first album comes out and, uh, you know, I get, I'm looking at the charts now. It got up to number seven mm -hmm. on the top 200 charts, mm -hmm. number four on the R&B charts. And mm -hmm. it goes platinum. Yeah. So you're platinum right out the gate, <laughs> Grammy nomination. I mean, you're off to the races at this point. Yeah. So then it's out time for album number two. Yeah. For a cool relax. Yeah. And um, Babyface is still in the mix. Yeah, absolutely. But this is where I, I, I like I was saying I was more or less spreading my wings and really trying to step outside of the. You know, being overshadowed by my influence of you know, that I, that Babyface had, you know, mm -hmm. and um, 
you know, I, I think that that was sort of like something that began to spread a little bit uh, faster than I wanted it to in a way where all of a sudden now I wasn't my own artist. I felt very, very much like, okay, I've been working all this time to be a musician and a producer, not this sort of pseudo, you know, replica artist. You the, know what the I mean? The white baby face. Yeah, exactly. The white baby <laughs> face. Exactly. White um, face. And you know, exactly. I mean, my, <laughs> right. you know what? Uh, ev everyone who works with him, um, whether it be Tevin Campbell, Johnny Gill, uh, Tony Braxton, Karen White, um, you know, after seven, they all have the, the polishing of his style on mm -hmm. their records. Um, and when, you know, when I got my chance to work with him, I wanted nothing but to do just the exact same thing. So when people hear that, they hear, they hear me doing, you know, very, very much his realm, his vibe. But when they hear me do They Don't Know and they hear all my other music, Are You Still Down with Tupac? Yeah. Uh, there was no denying that there was more to it than just that, you know. And Cool Relax was sort of my way of being able to let people know everything that, else that came with me, you know, um, all the other influence. Hip hop is a huge influence in, you know, in my style. And um, that leads me into, you know, the, the collaboration I had on the Cool Relax album with, with, uh, with Tupac, which is, well, you know. I, mean, yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna first talk about They Don't Know. Yeah, for sure. Because that was really the biggest song you ever put out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you put it together, did you know right away that it was gonna be a monster like that or no? Funny enough, when I turned that song in, it was, um, it was looked at as sort of like, okay, this will be a cool song for the album. It wasn't at all like, oh man, we got to smash. And I thought it was absolutely my best song ever, you know. <laughs> it, I felt like it was saying a lot for me. Like everything we're talking about right now, about kind of wanting to be my own artist and not really wanting to be compared so much so much anymore, you know. Like, okay, cool. Like, I, I, I live that influence to the death, you know what I mean? I'll, ride that to the death but i am my own artist and so this song kind of said that statement for me in another way but at the same time it was also kind of like all right haters back 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 up because <laughs> i came you know to tell you some you know some truth right here you know what i mean so yeah and it still kind of like works for me like that to this day it really is sort of like an anthem that i i still at you know at this age i'm i'm looking at it like man this is really something I need to continue to tell myself, you know? I mean, a hell of a song. Thank you. A hell of a song. Like, I was listening to your catalog, you know, before we started today, and it was like, oh, yeah, I remember this shit. This was <laughs> 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 this was all over the place when it came out. Yeah. And yeah. that was, uh, yeah, I remember, like, because I remember the, the Babyface collab before, but mm -hmm. since I'm not really an R&B guy, yeah. it kind of, for me, it kind of came and went. Yeah. But, but that, that song just had, like, a staying power. Man, thank you, man. Yeah. Well, it was produced by my man Tim Kelly and Bob Robinson, and um, you know I wrote it, and uh, it was it was it came at a time where I was definitely going through some things relationship wise, where it it fit you know both for me relationship wise and also as a statement to sort of like everyone that I was creatively surrounded by, like hey, don't listen to what people say because at the end of the day, it's what's going on in my heart that you know no one knows about, but the people that are closest to me, so yeah. And then comes Are You Still Down? That's with right. With Tupac. Yeah. So tell me how that song developed. Well, it's interesting. I had this friend, uh, I, have this, I have this boy, his name is uh, Bezo, and uh, Bezo goes back to the Yo! MTV rap days. So Bezo knew Tupac, and Bezo was at the How Do You Want It video shoot, and Bezo calls me up and says, guess who's a fan of your music? And I'm at his video shoot right now. And you need to get down here, like, right now. And I said, who? who where, where you at? I'm at Tupac's video shoot for How Do You Want It? I said, okay, cool. He's like, come down here right now. I said, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Came down. It was like Fort Knox. <laughs> it's, getting, <laughs> it's like getting through, like, a barricade to get through, like, another one, like, to show, like, my ID to get searched to go through another metal detector. I mean, it was death it row. Was, death row it at its insane. height. 
with the beef at its height. I mean, how do you want? It? Yeah, I, I remember when that song came out. I think he was beefing with Biggie and yeah, the East Coast Absolutely West Coast was. War was, I mean, this was. This was crazy. Yeah, I think hit him up was already out. So yeah, so this was, was like really and and Tupac was the biggest artist in the world essentially yeah. of any genre. Well, he had called specifically to have me come down to the video shoot. Mm -hmm. So I came down. I remember I had Eric B from Eric B and Rakim, mm -hmm. you know, the DJ Eric B. He, he met me he met me at the gates, you know, and he's like, "What's up, man?" I was like, you know, in my car and I was playing my beats and he, "What's that? What's that? Was something new I'm playing, you know." And uh he got in for a second. We I played him some beats. He's like, man, you need to play this for Pac. Come bring this in. So I brought the same beat tape, you know, in for Pac. And I saw Pac, met him, saw Casey and JoJo in there, Johnny J, you know, rest in peace as well. He was the one who made the, the beat for Are You Still Down. Uh, he produced the beat. And, uh, uh -huh. and that was one of Tupac's main producers. Yes, it was. So, so he made that for you. Yes. Well, he uh -huh. made that for, for Pac, essentially. And in Pac, so the story is, uh, I was playing my beats for, for Tupac, and he immediately started to write freestyle right in front of me. I remember Sway and Tech were both there, and they are both witnesses to this day. They were like, I remember when he heard your beats, he just lit up and started just rapping right there, you know, started freestyling. So I was like, man, we got to put this down in the studio. And then Casey and JoJo are like, oh man, look, man, you got you one right now, you know? Like, <laughs> they knew it was gonna happen, right? So I was like, okay, well, maybe we'll make this happen. I didn't really expect it to happen right away, right? So after that, I kind of went home, like, thinking, okay, maybe that, that, that might happen. Two weeks later, he gave me a call, come down to Can Am Studios. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll come down to Can Am Studios. And he's got all the gear there for me to basically make a beat. But I look um, at the parking lot, in the parking lot when, when I'm parking, there's a Burgundy Rolls Royce out there, or Bentley, whatever it was. And my CD is sitting, my first CD, Bonafide, is sitting in the driver's side on the, on the you know, driver's side seat. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's Pac's car, like, oh, he, he was playing my music. That's tight, right? So just that was always locked in my, you know, my mind. When I, before I even got in the session, I knew that he had the album. So uh, I walked in and I saw Pac, and he was like, you know, so let me hear some beats. So I played him the beats, and then he's like, let me play you some of mine. The first beat he played me was "Are You Still Down?" Uh -huh. The beat, the beat for "Are You Still Down?" It's Johnny okay. Jay's beats, and I was like, that's the one. So I, I said, damn, what I was going to play, <laughs> this is the one right here, you know. Okay. And um, right away we got to it. And, you know, it was about three hours in. I mean, we were pretty much done with the song. I mean, we, we talked about relationships. We talked about being in relationships that had gone wrong and sort of like wanting to holler back, being like on some reminiscent kind of like vibes, you know, and um, almost like that. That drunken phone call, you know, late night, like to your ex, like, you know, you still think about me, <laughs> you know, that kind of vibe, right? But in a song, you know, and um, and at the same time, nobody had done a collaboration between uh, R&B and, 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 and hip hop. It was very rare. I mean, Mary J had done it with Matt. Method Man, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Bell Bib DeVoe were doing Bell, it. Bell Bib DeVoe were doing yeah. it. But it was more like, they were kind of like, almost like. High energy, kind of. It, it wasn't hip hop like we knew hip hop was, like a real rap song with a singing, you know, a singing artist. Yeah. You didn't really have that. I think Jody Watley and Rakim did something early on. And mm, I just, right. you just never really heard that sort of like that aggressive um, delivery of a rap and then you know, the softness of a singer right next to it. Because right after we did that song, it became to be this like, sort of like this, it would just, everybody started doing it. And it was like, it just, it just caught on. And I'm not saying that we, you know, we were the ones to like first do it or anything like that. I just, I just remember when it wasn't something that was a very popular thing. And I remember turning that song in, oddly enough, them saying, you can't put this out. And really? he was still alive, mind yeah. you. 
and then he passed. Okay, so why wouldn't they let you put it out? Well, they were very concerned about the fact that we were two completely different artists. Uh, I had this sort of like real clean, you know, lover's boy kind of vibe, you know, uh, romantic R&B dude. And then you had, you know, Tupac, thug, you know, thug thug life, you know what I mean? <laughs> and how are you going to mix these two vibes and make, you know, he just came off um, Someone to Love with featuring Babyface and, and Pretty Girl. And, uh, you know, we, c we can't really grime his image up too much. That's what they, they thought. And I thought, well, that's not really what it is. It's, this is me doing this. This happened for real. This is like a collaboration that happened for real. Mm -hmm. And this, this is what's happening out there in the world. People are running into each other and they want to collaborate. And whether it makes sense to you or not is, is not the issue. You know, This is something that's going to make sense in the future. But y'all got to let this happen, you know? And um, so they, they sort of like, we're like, all right, we'll, we'll put that in the way. We'll see, we'll see. And then he died. So you guys put this song together. It gets accepted for your album. But does the album drop before he passes or no? Or does, does the song nah, come out? No, nah, so, so here's the thing. Is what, what, they, right. made, they, they, they basically, when, when he passed, two weeks after the song, he was killed. After we recorded the song, he was killed two weeks later. Right, in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Yeah, we, we've done a lot so of So I, I, I got to know Tupac, and then he was killed right away. It was like someone that you knew for a brief moment, you got to know him for a brief moment, had this moment that was extremely, you know, strong. So much was exchanged in that those three hours, and it was probably more than three hours. I'm just saying the amount of time that it took for us to get the bulk of the song done was three hours, right? It was mad time spent in the studio with, with Pac. I watched him record To Live and Die in L.A. Mm. You know, uh, he, he sat there and watched me put down the vocoder parts for the background was girl, it's all right. And I remember I was, you know, we were drinking Hennessy and, and you know, everything was kind of, you know, real loose for a second. I was messing up you know, on the vocal, vocal part, you know, vocoder part. And uh, I was trying to get my Roger Troutman on, you know, and he was like, all right, man, no more Hennessy for John. Like, play that right, man. This ain't no joke. Play it. This is a record right now. Play it right. I was like, all right. <laughs> and I was like, you know, Tupac, you know, telling you to play it right. You're going to play it right, you know. So that's the take you hear is me like, girl, I <laughs> really try to be really right on it. You know what I mean? But, I mean, he was, he was a lovely dude. And he was like, man, at the end of the session, he was, man, just... You leaving already, you know? I was like, man, I gotta go. It's like four in the morning, you know, it's late. He's like, all right, man, love you, man. Don't waste your talent, man. Kill, kill it out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just remember him being like somebody that I knew I was gonna see again. And that all of a sudden now I had this ally that was like very powerful, yeah. you know what I mean? And I, 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 I left with the world on my, you know, I was like, oh man, I felt like Superman, you know? I've interviewed a lot of people who, who had worked with Tupac. Yeah. And a lot of them said that Tupac had this kind of urgency to get this music out. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them said that you know, they felt like he knew he wasn't going to live for a long time. And he had to get this music out as quickly as possible. He wrote his death before his death happened. He shot the video for I Ain't Mad At You a week before he got killed. Like, why would you do a video about you getting killed? And then a week later, you get killed. Why would you write songs about, you know, dear mama and being a loving son to your mama and, and all of these things kick into a play now? Yeah, and there's a bullet coming at him on his last album cover, you know, the Machiavelli album and everything. It's... He knew it. He worked like a fucking racehorse. Like, the way I work now, I ain't half as what he is. Like, he you say Bolt, I'm like Carl Lewis. But this motherfucker, and I swear to God, this how this nigga used to work. We'd be in the studio, he'd, he'd make a song, it'd be like 30 niggas in here, he'd make a song, he'd let him get on the song, him get on the song, him get on the song. As soon as the song go off, he won't even listen to it. Put that shit over there, pull the next beat up. He get on to the next beat, they writing some more shit. Boom, they finish that song, then he say, I'm gonna do one by myself. 20 minutes later, 
he and that motherfucker spitting it. There's three songs this nigga didn't did in an hour. Three songs he ain't listened to nam one of them. Then he may go smoke and chill or whatever drink, come back, pull another beat up. When he and this motherfucker, he and this motherfucker making music. Everybody in here making music. So it's like to me, why the fuck was he working so so fast and so hard and trying to finish all these records up? He knew. He had to know. You gotta hurry up and get all that music out. That's what I heard people say. He had he had his shirt off in a session and I could see the bullet holes, you know what I mean? The yeah. scars. And it's a t it's intense when you see someone's bullet holes, it, it kind of puts it into perspective. It's not like tattoos. Yeah. It's like where the flesh is, you know what I mean? It's, it's like flares out like that, like in lines. And it's like pretty intense. And he had like six or something like that or whatever it was on his chest. So he had like slacks on with his shirt off and like dress shoes with the white, the white dress shoes on, never forget. You know, he came with a Versace shirt on and he just would take it off during the session, just be like, you know, with the chains, and, you know, it's just Tupac, you know, exactly how you see. And he, I remember him, you know, he had this very tough uh, exterior, but once you sat down to get into the song, oh man, it wasn't nothing that he wouldn't, an emotion, it wasn't nothing that was left, un, no stone unturned, you know what I mean? Like he would go to the, you know, to the very depths, the core of what you feel, what you feel, what what, you know, what are you really trying to go? What are you trying to say right now? Before he would you know, just write the line down, you know. Um, I remember that about him. He's like, nah, don't don't just sing it, man. Go back, go back. Really feel that one right there, you know. And some of the things that he said to me will stick with me for life, you know. I'll, I'll never forget it. Well, two weeks later, after recording the song, he gets killed. Uh, how did you feel when you first got that phone call? Yeah, when he was, you know, when he was killed, um, it was like all of the air just taken out from everything that I had, you know, explained to you that I felt like Superman leaving there, you know what I mean? It was like somebody just stole all the air out and just came crashing down to earth because, you know, part of me was very much like thinking like, well, I, I got blessed with this situation and this is just something that I, you know, he's gonna live through it because he got shot six times and he lived. Mm -hmm. So he got shot again. And this is just miraculous. He's gonna live. Yeah. So we part all, of me thought, thought like, <laughs> I, I think he's gonna live, you know? And so the saddest part was, is like we had this, this I wanted to get in touch with him. You couldn't get in touch with him. Yeah. No one could get in touch with him. I was in London in a church recording in Air Studios, which is an old renovated church and it's where the Beatles used to record and it's where they recorded like Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band. It's like mm. big cathedral um, recording studio. So I'm in this cathedral church when I find out that you know Tupac had been shot and basically you know he was gonna die and you know I don't know I it, there was a part of me that was just kind of like okay Damn the song, you know, damn the song, this is a person, you know what I mean? Like, he's he got shot, like, again? Like, that's not fair, you know, it's not fair. And then everything that went with it, I thought, oh, God, now this is, it's not just about him being gone now. Now the burden's going to come with, we've recorded this song, like, I... I did a song with this man, you know what I mean? We had this song to answer about. We, we were just gonna put this song out. We had talked about being in the video for God's sake together and done, getting dressed up and you know what I mean? I mean, my entire, all my dreams were shattered, bro. Like, you know what I mean? For real. And, and it wasn't so much about me. That's, that's really describing in a selfish way because at that point I was just worried about his family and like, the people that knew him better than I knew him. I, I had known him for a short bit, you know what I mean? So I was just thinking like, oh my God, this this, this guy, you know, I it was just too too much to handle too too fast, you know, and then and then what's so crazy is is that of course then all the opportunists come into the situation and they're like, oh you gotta put the song out, you gotta put the song out. And of course to me I was just like Shh. I, I ain't touching that. And I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to even put the song 
you know, I, I was very, very much like, I didn't know what to do. And it, and it was it, it was up to Afini really, Afini Shakur to really make that song something that needed to happen. Huh. Because she basically said, you know, no, my son never played me his music because he was always sort of looking out for my, you know, what I would find offensive. Yeah. But he was very, very much excited to play me this song, Are You Still Down, which is the reason why she named his first album that ever came out after his his, After his death, his death. Yeah, it was called Are You Still Down? Right, because yeah. you guys do, well, you do the video without Tupac. Yeah. And um, and they forced that, you know, they, they it were- It seemed a little awkward. Yeah, they, they, they forced that. They were, they were uh, you know, and I knew, I knew that no matter how that song came out, that was gonna be a burden for me to hold, you know, on my own, to be, not have him around to vouch for that. Uh, but you know, we poured the, the the cognac out for him in the video. Babyface offered me his house to shoot the video at. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very much like, please do this for this song because everyone loves this song. And my morale was so damaged at that point for that album. You have to understand, I had just finished doing. Everyone really looks at Cool Relax. Most of my fans, they tell me that's that's one of their favorite, most favorite albums of mine. You know, so I look back at those songs and I'm like. Think about how hard it was to have those songs still have the life that they did with this sort of like this glooming morale behind, you know, behind it with Tupac's death. It was very, very hard. It was a very, very, very much a burden uh, for for someone at my age to be able to handle that kind of a, the kind of pressure or the politics involved with that. Mm -hmm. And all I did was just collaborate with the man, you know, and I was in the studio. He. He was there with me, you know, so it's it's hard because he's not here to say, nah, man, you know, um, you know, we did that. <laughs> well, the album comes out and it goes double platinum, yeah. which is your biggest album yeah. to date. Uh, peaks at number three on the charts. Amazing. It's uh, crazy. And you know, I mean, you're. Two biggest songs essentially are on that album. Yeah. So, you know, and although it had the the shadow of Tupac's death, I mean, it also kind of helped elevate it in, in a morbid Absolutely. sort of way as no, well. Because you know, yeah, unfortunately, dead rappers get better promotion, and you know it's that crazy. that type of yeah, that's that's the what ugly was really, side of music. That's you know? really what was dark about the whole thing that made it hard for me to ha ever have sort of like success, in a sense of really feeling success behind it was, and then you have to understand, it's, it's, it's been sort of something that has been a theme that has reoccurred in my, my career, because you know, we lost Johnny J too. Right. Later on, Yeah. you know, and me and Johnny had returned together to make collaborations to remember Pac, you know, in, in sort of a, you know, memorial kind of way. Um, we did part two to Are You Still Down together right. in the studio. And Which was cool, but it's hard to touch the original. Well, no, you can't ever. Yeah. I mean, the, the intention wasn't ever to do that. It's like kind of like building a, uh, you know, a, you know, a, 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 you know, having some sort of like ceremonial burial for someone, you know what I mean? In yeah. a sense, as a songwriter, I like to leave things behind because they last forever. So this is yeah. my way of being able to say, you know, well, Johnny said, you know, I have this, this, this acapella that I want to use. And, and I was like, okay, cool. And he was just like, man, I swear, when we put that acapella on, it was like the way it lined up everything, it was so crazy. It was like he was back with us. And I'll never forget that session because there was just so much magical feeling in that session on the second time yeah. getting, you know, to work with his voice you know, and not him in the studio, but the essence with Johnny. And to have lost Johnny soon after that was, man, it's just, you know, it's just a tremendous thing to think back. And I just want to say rest in peace to both those guys, you know what I mean? Tremendously, you yeah. know, important for my career and, you know, for everything I've been able to do, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'll be honest, like I'm one of the biggest Tupac fans ever. Like I've done more Tupac related interviews than probably anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hands down, but 
after Machiavelli, I just couldn't really listen to the rest of his albums because I knew that they were just... Constructed. Pieces. They were constructed yeah. after the fact. Well, you know and, what? It's and, one way... Know, it's for one me, way it just couldn't, couldn't yeah. capture that, that Tupac magic. For me. Not it, to say... I mean, Are You Still Down, I think, went multi-platinum or something, right? The, the album. Are, are the, You Still Down? His album. His album. Still yeah, his album yeah. probably went multi-platinum. Oh, sure he had a bunch did. of projects that did well. Yeah. For me, it pretty much stopped at Machiavelli. See, it, see it, 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 it was a lot to lose him. Um, what is just like it's a lot for us to lose Nipsey Hussle right, right. now. And you hear every car I hear banging his music, just like I heard every car banging Tupac's music when yeah. we first lost Tupac. And um, it's the kind of thing where we didn't want to lose him, so we wanted to let his essence live on with. You know, every producer virtually doing a remix on his with his vocals and getting to live with that sense. That's why it's such an honor for me. I wear it as such a badge of honor for that I got to actually work with the man himself in the studio. I met him. You know, he said my name on the record. He talked about, you know, his own sort of like reflection on how he felt people needed to view me. He's like, let them feel where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, he knew what it was. He was trying to sort of like relate to me in a way, in his own way of saying like, nah, you real. Let him feel where you coming from, JB, John B. You know, and at the end, he's like, John B did that. You know, he's like, they <laughs> shout me out. Like, I'm like, man, she wants you, John. She wants you. You know, he's in the studio with me, like talking <laughs> about like, you know, man, I don't care. Like, I don't care who she is. Like, she she wants you, man. She She out there, she... You, you broke somebody's heart just like she broke yours. You broke her heart, too, you know? <laughs> He's, like, being real with me. I was like, okay. And he actually was the one to really kind of, like, orchestrate that song. Like, that's why it's so special, because before rappers were singers, you know, Tupac was, you know, telling me, you know, girl, it's all right, baby, and it's there in your eyes, yeah. And I was like, really? Okay, like... That's how it, I, I'm. I'm the singer, but you're singing to me. You right, know, well, he, so. he co-produced that song. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, he Johnny J wasn't there when we were actually recording the record. He did the beat, but he wasn't there for us to record it. It was just him and I in mm. the studio. Yeah, so Tupac Can't helps him. kind of arrange it. So yeah, he like was that. there very much melodically getting involved there, yeah. and um, you can tell that I had my little input. But I think what you got was like. Him saying, now, this is what John B. sounds like now. Not the baby face influence, not the, you know, not, this is you. And I was like, okay, this is what I sound like now, okay? <laughs> and still to this day, it's like, it's sort of the stamp, mm -hmm. really. And there's not, a, there's not a moment where Pac isn't sort of like my angel sitting on the shoulder right now. And my, you know, in every sense of the, you know, from, you know, having to deal with um, the way the, the, the game has changed to you know getting on stage and and, and and feeling like okay I'm older now do I still have what it takes now are you still down you know it's it literally works for so many things in my life you know well so that album goes double platinum and then you put out your third album yeah pleasures you like yeah and that seemed to have more of a of a hip hop kind of influence yeah absolutely, absolutely. I mean well Nas is on it yeah a lot of hip hop for, artists for fine, on finer things. Yeah. How did Nas get on your song? Well, I wanted Nas. You know, I was like, you know, I, you I produce, I produce, you know, this type of music as well. You know, um, it was very, very much influenced by Sade, that track, um, Stuart Matthewman, Sweetback. I love the the smoothness and simplicity of their arrangements. And so, like, I kind of tried to come up with my own little vibe like that and when i had that track i thought this is this has got Nas's vibe like he would sound so dope you know his tone and everything and uh he hadn't even heard the track but we we said we want to make a collaboration happen he was in la and next thing you know i come home and Nas is playing pool in my living room and i'm like man what <laughs> like are you serious like you ready to do this and he went down there in the studio and started writing to it and uh, the first thing he wrote was insane. It was amazing. So he went in there and he recorded, and then he's like, I don't like it. So he, <laughs> he, 
we went in there and I had to wait another, like, however long it was. And he took his time, man. This guy wasn't messing around at all. He wrote a completely brand new record, which was Final Things. And we recorded that. And, uh, yeah, you know, he was very, very much of a... I love collaborating with, with artists in the studio together, putting our heads together. He's very much a, you know, that's probably one of the dopest collaborations next to the... Right along with the Tupac collaboration, yeah, um, because it's like you know, hey, I need a word here. Um, what's a word that can you know, like who who was uh, you know uh, such and such his girlfriend back in the fifties? You know, you know, and I'm going, oh, uh, you know, we have to think back and of a word that'll rhyme with the whatever. And so yeah, to have having even just being a fly on the wall of Nas's process. Being a fan of his music, you know, as a lyricist, as an MC, you know, and really that terminology is used very lightly now. MC is like, I feel like I was in the room with some of the realest MCs there ever was. Yeah. And just being able to have that be a part of something that I can say will always be something that I, I, I take pride in, like living for collaborations like that, you know? So yeah, the song Final Things is definitely, it'll stand up there and as one of, you know, one of those gems for me, yeah. You know. Well, uh, that third album goes platinum. Yeah. You're pretty much three for three at this point. <laughs> is the money rolling in at this point by, by album number three? Are you rich now? I mean, well, <laughs> we'll say this, I wrote, primarily almost every song on these albums Aha. and produced almost every song on so these you're, albums. So you're getting the whole publishing check. So, yeah, so it's not, and the you know, performing and stuff, so it's like, yeah. you know, the, the money was there, you know, and being a writer and producer of your own music is far more lucrative because, you know, there's so many different areas to make, you know, to make a profit in terms of like what you're doing, you know. How much money are you spending to promote your music and to make videos and to go on tour and you know and then how much of it actually is being recouped you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. that there can actually be a profit and so yeah i saw a profit because we were we were you know doing smart business okay. and epic was an incredible company to work with Edmonds were incredible people to work with so uh, was, I, was I had, under epic yeah, I would say just call it the Edmonds Record Group. Okay. Back then is what they called it, E R G, and Sony Epic. Yeah, and um, Five Fifty and Polly Anthony over there was was my president, and she, you know, and then also you know with the Epic, you know, international as well because it wasn't just United States. I had an international mm -hmm. deal, so I was able to go all over the world. My first album and have. You know, I had a number one in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> My only number one in the world, but it was in Singapore, you know what okay. I mean? So, yeah, I went there and uh, I heard my radio, my song on the radio, Pretty Girl, like 10 times in one day. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so you have these three albums and they all go platinum. Then the fourth album, Stronger Every Day. Are you still on Yabium at this point? So now you're gonna make me think back and have to do my research here. So this is where it all sort of comes to get kind of gets a little bit weird. Um, is stronger every day was when all of the uh, labels, major labels, were doing a sort of like everyone was rearranging their like mergers and yeah, so forth. mergers. Yeah. All the old people that were working for the labels were sort of being you know moving leaving the labels so all of my team that was set up at sony was sort of like being you know removed and um and also at even at the you know at the in the edmund situation it was all kind of changing around a lot too mm -hmm. as well and um yeah so i made a move to work with with um matthew knowles at the time which right. was uh, beyonce's dad yeah right which was um sanctuary records mm -hmm. And we were going to do some cool things. One of the collaborations I was really excited about doing on that album, Stronger Every Day, was a song by, by, uh, written by Tank. Um, and it was called Lately. It was the first single from the album. And there's another collaboration on there. It was with Beanie Man. And uh, it was, we went out to Jamaica to do that. And that was really cool to collaborate with Beanie in, in Kingston, Jamaica, out there. And, you know, and just get the vibes of... Uh, 
of the islands, you know what I mean, on that record. So that album had something in its own to offer that I had really, you know, hadn't done that yet. And uh, I was excited to show a dance hall influence, you know, for the first time and to show, uh, you know, a collaboration with Tank, you know, because Tank was sort of new at the time. He was making his up, up and coming, you know, ascension as a writer, songwriter, producer, artist. So he sang on the backgrounds with me on that, and um, that was definitely cool. And as well as um, the song, is the song Through the Fire on there? Is that, no, no. is that on there? Yeah. Through the Fire with Scarface? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was another one that was very special from that album. Getting to collaborate, you know, like I said, I'm a huge hip hop head. So, I mean, you know, being able to work with Scarface, get to talk to him on the phone and say, let's write a record about having vices let's let's write a record about you know just that dark side of of entertainment and and let's do it in a met metaphoric way um let's talk about literally walking through the fire you know what i mean and um and so yeah it that was sort of like the first kind of it's you know the first kind of record like that i had ever tried to write and uh to have someone with that almost martin luther king-esque preacher kind of type of swag you know he's just he's got that it's there's just such a it's just such a spirit in his voice um, when you hear him talk even on the phone oh, yeah. he sounds the yeah, same. I know, you I know know. Scarface. Yeah, we, <laughs> me and him, yeah, we talk. Yeah, we've done interviews, but we, we also yeah, talk. He's profound, yeah. you know. Oh yeah. And so like to have him, um, that was sort of like the you know almost like the second coming of Pac for me to work with his voice it was like a, almost yeah. like the aftermath of yeah. of that it was like okay. We, you know, we, you know, someone profound like that to be on my record like that, it was, you know, it, it's a trip, man. I've been so blessed to work with some of my favorites, you know. It, everyone has, each of these artists have something different to offer, but in their, there's a, there's a common bond between them all because they're, they were all legends in their own right, had something extremely important to give me that they left behind. And, and you know, Scarface is still here, so, you know, I want to say, big up to him and everything that he does because he's still smashing I, his last album was crazy I oh yeah. yeah his last yeah. album was dope yeah he's, he's still very much one of my favorite uh, voices in hip hop yeah you kind of started the whole you know white kid doing R&B mm. and you had tremendous success you know three platinum albums one of them mm. double platinum you know then you had kind of like the next wave of white R&B Mm -hmm. artists and you made some comments about him mm -hmm. uh, Robin Thicke for one what was your take on Robin Thicke Robin Thicke uh, was he was actually he came up the same ERG basically uh, he was signed by Babyface and signed by um, oh really he was signed by Babyface yeah he was signed by okay. Babyface and, and Andre uh, Harrell okay and um, it was a trip to watch my career kind of like be sort of like fall into this hoofla of like you know who's gonna who the label is gonna be and if they're gonna be as supportive as as epic was and if we're gonna have as clear of a run as we had every all you know it seemed like there was a real i was catered to at epic you know that to not have that sort of that same energy with my career and to watch it happen for someone else was definitely a challenge for me. It was it was humbling to watch another guy kind of come into the scene and sort of like everyone was asked, "What do you think about Robin Thicke?" In every interview I ever did, <laughs> right? Which actually is kind of cool. We actually just ran into each other. We did a show together not too long ago in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's been all these years we've never met. Oh, really? And we just ran into each other. I said, you know, he asked me. He's like, so you know, what about that? We would talked about, it. you know, basically we were, we were brief about it. But I said. I've had to talk about you in many interviews. <laughs> As you're and talking about it. And he him goes, now. that's gotta suck. And I was like, it absolutely <laughs> kinda does, you know, but I nevertheless did it, you know. And, so, and I try to be as respectful as possible. Because they were, I think people want to pose like almost like fighters against each other. Like this guy's yeah. a good fighter, this guy's like, I wanna watch him fight. And it's like, nah. Um I I I, I, I from the very beginning I felt threatened because obviously I was, you know, that was sort of like my neck of the woods, the baby face thing. And I, I, I felt kind of like, okay, this guy, he kind of came in and 
stole some of my wind, you know what I mean? It really, really was apparent for me early on. I let it kind of get to me a little bit. And um, I think people kind of kind of fed into it a bit. Yeah. And so that, that was a challenge. And I, I, I definitely had to um, adjust to the whole scene of it not being a, a, um, a new thing to be a white guy in R&B, that there was other guys that were in this thing too that were yeah. doing this thing. And now you, you were gonna have to deal with, you know, sort of being compared to them and mm -hmm. vice versa. I wonder if they were ever asked about me though in their interviews, you know what I mean? <laughs> but well, you've actually offered to, to battle Robin. Oh no, let's not talk about that. <laughs> no? <laughs> We're actually cool, yeah. yeah. Well, you know but I mean, mean, I mean, just because you're battling doesn't mean you guys aren't cool. Oh, like, you know what? I, I I'm, think compa that, I'm competitive I think with, with about, other people. Yeah, you're talking about what? Probably 2006. I said something like that. Well, like, know, a, I, like a piano versus grew, piano. I actually vocal. grew my hair long. You know what I mean? <laughs> in spite, <laughs> in spite of Robin Thicke, because he had the long hair. Remember? No, no. You know, it's all. It was all. Anything that was said was said in jest and complete. Like I think I was making, making fun of the fact that we were both white guys you know what i mean we should have a contest with who could you know what i mean something funny like that and I'll back then it would have been it would have been funny i would love to do a song together how about that and just yeah. let's leave it at that and that would be a yeah. dope collaboration yeah, Rob, robin think is dope man he absolutely I mean, blurred is. lines I th that down doesn't as, really uh, def define that doesn't define him though for me i think when i hear a record like the first song that he came well the first song that i really recognized him for was lost without you Beautiful, beautiful ballad, and uh, his falsetto is amazing. But why are we talking about Robin Thicke though right now? Anyway, let's talk about something else. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. I'm a fan of both of you guys. Thank you, brother. You know I mean? I, I'm Big up Robin Thicke though. You know what I mean? Keep doing your thing, man. Let's smash, smash, you know, smash the game, man. With more soul music, it's just great feelings that the people can enjoy, man. Yeah, man. At least something special behind, you know. Well, you continue to put out projects. Uh, you know, after after Stronger Every Day, you put out Holiday Wishes for Me to You, mm -hmm. Helpless Romantic in 2008, mm -hmm. Comfortable Swag mm -hmm. in 2012. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you, you're pretty much independent. Yes. So much has changed um, since the days of being signed to labels and putting out CDs, actual tangible items in where, where do you buy a CD now? Where do you actually go to buy a physical unit of like, how is it sold now? It's not CD, it's, it's e <laughs> eBay. Amazon, Craigslist, eBay. Maybe. <laughs> you might find one. Street oh, there's corner. a place called Amoeba. Amoeba, <laughs> think it's yeah, like, Rasputin's. It's like, you're right. Right. <laughs> it's like some guy who's got my stuff on reprint. He's, <laughs> right. he's like vinyl company. I don't know, you know, the thing is like every, you can't really compare the game back in the 90s to the game now, you know, because it's apples and oranges, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. you can't fuse the two. But what you do have to do is adjust the times because otherwise you're gonna be a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see the, you look at a guy like me, looking about social media, you know, what do you mean? Uh, my social media numbers, how many friends I have, like, well, I sold millions of records, like people, stood in line and un took the time to un unwrap the plastic that was so hard to get off the CDs. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The time it took to get that off, you like, by the time you got off there, you were like, all right. Yeah, it probably sounds good by now, you know what I mean? All that work up. Oh, yeah, you're opening up the thing and you're checking out the lyrics and you're looking at the, you know, the, the production, pictures. Production credits. The production credits, yep. the, the, the pictures. I mean, it was... a. It was an experience, it's a, a visceral experience. experience. And, and you had to spend like $16 on it. And especially- It was a commitment, you know, one, I, one time. Like, like in yeah. high school, I remember it was like, okay, you know, I had a job in high school and I could buy one or two CDs, you know, a week. Yeah. If I had the money and it's like, I had to make that, that purchase count. Yeah. You know, you can't just stream whatever you want the, the whole month. You had to, okay, I'm gonna buy this and you I hope I mean? it's good because it. there's no return policy at yeah, Tower right? Records, right? <laughs> yeah. You're stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I think it was much more of, okay, I'm going to make this commitment right now, buy these, you know, 12, 14 songs, whatever it mm -hmm. was. And as an artist, it was very validating to have this many records be, you know, pushed at one time. You know, I could, I could say this 
um, one time, and and you know, if you bought the album, you might not listen to every record, but I gave you the chance to hear my entire sentiment. Mm -hmm. Because you have to understand, these records are talking about, you're talking about making these albums, you're talking about three out, three year, three years of my life, four mm -hmm. years of my life, maybe five years, and this, this new album is taking me, the longest it's ever taken me to make an album. How long? Five years. Okay, and you got a new project coming out. Yes, I do. And yes. the name of it is? It's called Understand. Okay. Yeah, um, the new single is featuring uh, Donnell Jones. Mm -hmm. It's a duet with Donnell Jones, and the song is entitled Understand. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those records where it's taking it back to the essence of what I gave you in the 90s, but with the, with the 2019 flair on it, you know what I mean? Um, the, I, you know, I've grown with the times, and I'm changing with the times. And I feel like the sonic palette is what it is today. So I pull what I like from, you know, how tracks go right now. You know, back in the '90s, we used a lot of sampled snares, a lot of organic kind of sampled snares from old jazz records or old funk records or whatever. Right now, we're in a very much a machine sort of TR808 kind of a phase where we, we like the 808s pretty much tough. Right, you know? sampling's too expensive these days. I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of obscure. The more the boutique style music right. uses that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love it all. Yeah. So I, I take what I want from, you know, I let the times influence me how I want, you know. And yeah. uh, it's like a cherry pick from the, for the best. I, I love, you know, production of Travis Scott. I love yeah. the ambience in, in, in today's music, you know, with the mixing. And a lot of the new tricks that this, you know, it's like the new sonic palette that these kids have, is a is a is <laughs> straight up my alley. I love it. I mean, I love the you know the the uh, the post Malones, the weekends. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has this sort of darker sounding R and B, I love it because it's bringing something new that didn't exist. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, as someone who has kind of a collection of what I consider timeless music. Thank you. I mean, you've been touring this whole time, I'm sure. Yes, touring is the you know the main bread and butter of what I do. Yeah. And as well as you know, when it when it all comes down to it, you're talking about your songs. So what better way of being able to celebrate your music uh, than to actually perform the songs? Yeah. You know, and be able to continue to sing those songs, even if you have one or two records that the world knows, and you just go out and sing a bunch of covers. That's still rewarding. But let alone, I've been able to have you know, a lot of records. So my album, I can, you know, I can go through now about nine albums now of record. Mm -hmm. I think it's eight or nine albums I can go through and sort of cherry pick from each album and I can give you about 90 minutes or more of music, you know, and not flinch, yeah. you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's been amazing because the fans kind of come up to the shows, you know, with such a vast knowledge of, of everything that I've done and I just feel so blessed in that sense of like that they even know that I did a collaboration with Nas or I did a collaboration with Guru or mm -hmm. um, you know so yeah it's it because that you know to me it's about the music and it's about what I'm gonna leave behind you know yeah. with this music it was never for me about being like famous for being like a sex symbol or being like a, a guy who did anything but music because I'm not a good dancer, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, John B., man, appreciate you coming in. Thank you, my man. Uh, like I you. said, man, very dope catalog. Thank you, my man. With, with timeless you. music that will continue to, to resonate long after all of us are gone. Thank you, my man. You know, I, mean, I, I know with what I do, I try to, I think about that. I think about what am I, I like, the interviews I'm doing right now, mm. how are people 100 years from now going to react to them? I hear you. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That, and I feel like the most successful people think beyond their own lifetimes, think about their legacies, and Absolutely. think about what exactly they're doing more so than just how much money will it make right now. Right. And, and I feel like with your art, that's how you approach it. Thank you, man. Yeah, That's absolutely. huge, man. I appreciate absolutely, that. Absolutely, man. You. And thank you for, you know, for, for keeping it real with me, man. You know, uh, I, I, I know you're a, you're, a, you're a serious head in, in hip-hop, for real. You do this thing, for real. This, yeah. You're the, you're the first one to flip the I Got Five on it beat on any, nobody had flipped it no, on no remix yet. You okay. flipped Are You Still Down on that, on that, on that mixtape, bro. Yep. So you killed that, yeah, man. man. And, uh, 
that was our beginning, but here we are, how many years later? 15 years later. Still rocking. Still rocking, man. Ah, still man. doing it good. Both of us still healthy. That's both right, Both of us brother. still looking good. Both grown men. We're that both grown like, men. We're doing our thing, man. Yeah. Congrats on everything. Right, man. And, uh, man, keep doing your thing. Bless looking you, forward man. to it. Respect to you. Peace. Thank you.